Good evening. G greetings. The Lord is with you. I'm Pastor Bob Quaintance at Good Hope Lutheran Church in uh, uh, Youngstown, Ohio. Or, whoops, better turn that light back on a little bit. There we go. Eh, too bright. There we go. Okay. Um, so I'm glad to have you with us. Good evening, Shirley and others who are on. I just got to be able to read my Bible. I got to go up a little bit more. There we are. Um, so glad to uh, to have you with us. We're going to start. Uh, we are in the book of Galatians now. Uh, if you haven't taken an opportunity to do so, you'd it'd be benefited by looking at the Bible Project. And this is the end of a nine-minute uh, video uh, on the book of Galatians. They're wonderful introductions. They do many different videos, but they have a video on all 60 books, 66 books of the uh, Bible, and some of them are two videos on a book. Um, but Galatians is only six chapters, and they covered in eight or nine minutes. Uh, and a wonderful introduction, and this little um, uh, copy I made of the last scene of uh, as the video ends is this little depiction of the the outline of uh, the book of Galatians, chapter 1 and 2, chapters 3 and 4, and chapters 5 and 6 go together. Uh, chapters 1 and 2 are about the gospel of the crucified Messiah, and then uh, chapter uh, uh, 3 and 4 about the uh, how the Messiah, through faith, creates a new multi-ethnic family, not just Jews only are the family of God. So we introduced this last night at uh, Wednesday worship for our uh, Lenten services, and I was able to teach on Galatians 1. You can review that by looking at the, at the uh, church website or the YouTube channel where you can see the evening service or the morning service. Uh, either one would work. Hi, Susie. Good evening to you and Linda and Mark and uh, Fred. Uh, good evening to everyone. Um, Fred, I got to see some pictures. Bob came yesterday with uh, his iPad with pictures from the photo safari uh, in Tanzania, I think. In any event, loved. Uh, many of the pictures only saw a few of the thousands of pictures he took. But um, uh, in any event, I'd like to uh, start and we'll get into chapter two of Galatians. We... Um, we begin as we make the sign of the cross together and say, we are under the care of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this night together. Thank you for the beautiful day. Thank you for the gift I received today to be able to uh, finish up late last night so that uh, I could come in today and and uh, uh, spend today working on taxes. Um but I was able also to take some time and just review chapter two. Just thank you, Lord, for for um, Paul and his willingness to fight for the, the essence and truth of the gospel. Um, we pray, Lord, that you would bless us as we journey this week and next in the book of Galatians. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, hi, Shirley. Good to see you. Uh, as I introduce this work, uh, it comes, uh, when we were in the book of Acts, I actually took a little moment to introduce his work of Galatians because it comes right, it was written most likely, and certainly I would think, and personally I think, uh, between the last verse of chapter 14 of the book of Acts and the first verse of chapter 15. Paul had come back from his missionary journey. Uh, he had reported about the salvation of Jews and Gentiles. And then in chapter 15, there's the large council to decide, do Gentiles really need to become uh, Jewish to be saved? And Paul had already written this letter to the Galatians and um, uh, defending the truth of the gospel. He didn't mention in chapter 15 the uh, Jerusalem council, so... I tend to think that that uh, he he would have done so had that already been held. So I think the writing of Galatians happens in about 48 A.D. and uh, um, uh, with uh, uh, right between chapter 14 and 15. I introduced the thought uh, yesterday in church about how he's fighting for the very 
essence of the gospel. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, by Christ alone, according to the word alone, to God alone, the glory. Uh, all those Reformation themes come from uh, St. Paul here in Romans and in Galatians. So yesterday, Paul um, uh, introduced that theme, uh, was astonished that they had so quickly abandoned the gospel for another gospel, although there isn't really any other gospel. Uh, so now he's going to get down to uh, telling us more about this gospel message today and um, how we are declared righteous by faith alone. And we're going to be introduced to the heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone. Here goes, chapter one, chapter two, verse one. Uh, he had said just previously that he had been away after he was saved into Arabia and then back to Damascus. And after three years after being saved, he came to Jerusalem. Then after 14 years, and the debate among scholars, is it 14 years in addition to the three or just a total after 14 years of, of his his being saved on the road to Damascus. Perhaps that fits better. Um, after 14 years uh, of uh, his encounter with Christ, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles. Now, it doesn't seem very likely that this is the public meeting of the church council when they gathered the whole church together to debate the issues of are we saved by grace alone, through Christ's blood alone, or do you need to follow the, the Jewish law? Because here he's only meeting privately with some of the influential leaders. That seems to connect with Acts chapter 11. If I can get back there quickly, here's chapter 10. Chapter 11, um, uh, Jesus is, uh, or it says in verse 25, part Barnabas had gone to Tarsus in Cilicia to find Saul and bring him back to work at Antioch among the Jewish and Christian and, and Gentile believers. Um, and then they were there for a whole year teaching, um, uh, and a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians, if you believe that. Um, if you remember that uh, study we had quite a while ago in Acts 11. Um, in those days, there was a prophet who came by who said to Agabus, and we met him later in, in Acts as well, who predicted a, a great famine in, in, around the world. And the believers in uh, Antioch took up a... Um, a uh, an offering for the poor Christians in Jerusalem. Many of the Christians had fled with the persecutions. And so the church that was left was less able to care for the poor. And so the church around the world took up offerings to, to help them um, in that time of need. And it says in the last verse of chapter 11, um, they, they took up an offering for the relief of the brothers and they, they did so sending it to the elders in Jerusalem by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. It may likely be that it was at that time that they came up after that year of being in uh, um, Antioch and, and, and preaching the gospel to Gentiles. Maybe at that time they came up. And I went up to Jerusalem with Barnabas, and here he adds the name of Titus. We're again back at Galatians chapter 2. I went up because... Well, back in Acts, we heard about the offering. But perhaps part of the reason they sent uh, not just Barnabas, but Paul was to bring, uh, to have what they were teaching approved. We're going to hear that right now. I went up because of the revelation I sent, I set before them, uh, because of a revelation, and I set before them, though privately, before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles. Now that phrase, he's going to use it here uh, several times, those who seemed influential, uh, the leaders of the Christian faith. Um, but for Paul, what was influential wasn't a person's p 
position, but the truth of the gospel. And were they teaching that? And so he would not tolerate anyone, even if they were influential, a leader, if they were straying from Christ alone and the cross alone as the saving event of God. So I presented to them the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles in order that, in order to make sure that I was not running or had run in vain. Here's what we're teaching. Do you believe this is the right path? Wonderful thing that Paul did uh, with Barnabas. Um, Paul is, is always strongly convicted. Uh, and you hear it in that language by those who seem influential. But he was willing to ask, is, am I on the right track? And maybe it was also a bit of a challenge. I think I'm on the right track. Are you on that track too? But it was certainly an occasion where he was checking out with the leadership of the church whether or not um, he was being faithful to the word of God. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Now, we're, again, we're writing to the Galatians, uh, the, the community where uh, people have come, the Judaizers, who said, well, yeah, I'm glad you accepted Jesus. I'm glad you've been baptized, but you can't really be a real Christian uh, and you can't really be saved unless you follow the Jewish laws, including circumcision. And so Paul has a strong point here. He says, after 14 years after being saved, after being in Antioch now that year teaching, he went up to Jerusalem and they didn't make Titus, uh, those influential people, we'll hear them named in a moment, they didn't make Titus get baptized. So what's going on here in Galatia, these Judaizers who are troubling you? Remember from yesterday, he said, let them be accursed, anathema, the Greek word that we use in our own language. Uh, let them be as a complete outsider, cut off, damned, uh, going to hell. It, it's just strong, strong lang language. But, but he was willing to check it out. And then he says, hey, they didn't even make Titus get circumcised. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, <laughs> somebody was against Paul's preaching. Well, we know that. Uh, his teaching about Christ alone. Some of the Judaizers, who we've seen earlier, were upset with Peter when he went to the house of Cornelius, uh, when we were in Acts chapter 10 and chapter 11. Um, uh, some of these people are still there causing trouble. Yet because of the false brothers, and of course they're false because they're not true to Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone. Um, yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ, freedom is going to be a major theme in, in his letter here. Um, no longer slaves, but, but set free. Not slaves to the law, and not slaves to sin, but set free by Christ. Uh, good evening, Joyce. I see you've come on as well. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ so that they might bring us into slavery. What is that slavery? The slavery to the law. You have to follow the law. And it's like slavery. It doesn't do anything for you. Slavery is a horrible thing. It only does something for the person who is the slave owner. It doesn't do a thing for the slave. Um, uh, Paul looks at following the law now as slavery. In one of his writings, he, he talks about his former life, that according to the law, he was blameless. But now he counts all that as a dung heap for the sake of knowing Christ. That's the slavery, the dung heap. Um, th these brothers spying out our freedom, wanting us to be slaves. To them, we did not yield in submission, not for a moment. Kind of sounds like the war in Ukraine right now and the president and other leaders in Europe saying, uh, there's a line to cross, uh, Putin. If you do anything in a um, uh, NATO country, um, you're going to have NATO to be at war with. Uh, there's a line to cross. Well, this is exactly what 
and, and we're not going to tolerate one inch of ground, uh, Biden says. Well, same kind of language here. Paul says, there's a line to cross, and we did not yield in submission for even a moment. We stood fast to Christ alone, by faith alone, through grace alone. We didn't yield for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. Paul is willing to yield in so many ways, in so many occasions. He wrote in another place, to Greeks I become Greek, to Jews I become Jews. Uh, I, I, I just try to do whatever I can to win anybody to Christ. But when it comes to the gospel, the veracity of the word of God, he will not yield an inch because the whole power of faith comes from the word. Faith cometh by hearing, he says in Romans 10. And hearing by the word of God, there's no hope for faith and therefore no hope for salvation without the pure word of God being taught. It's one of the reasons I'm so pleased to be part of the North American Lutheran Church is our, our commitment to, to the truthfulness and staying true to the word of God as it has been revealed for thousands of years. Uh, we're, we're not coming up with any new ideas here. This is just the human nature, the old sinner in us, not getting away into slavery, but being called out into the new life of Christ. So he's fighting for the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And now he uses that word again. From those who seem to be influential, whether they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Well, these are all true. But he's a bit irked. <laughs> Uh, with what's happening in Galatia, right? Uh, he's probably way beyond irked. He's probably fuming, angry, and you hear it in this book. Let him be accursed. I say again, let him be accursed. And those, those opening lines of admonition and correction, I am astonished that you Galatians are so quickly deserting him who called you, deserting Jesus. My goodness. Well, he's not given an inch, not on the gospel, not on the truthfulness of the word. I say, uh, on the contrary, when, um, I, 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 let me see. And from those who seem to be influential, whether they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seem to be influential added nothing to me. They didn't say I had to change a word of what I was preaching. On the contrary, verse 7, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me from mine to the Gentiles. And here he names the leaders who were those influential people. And when James, this is the brother of Jesus, the head of the church, to which the rest of the disciples um, uh, recognized his leadership, how the Holy Spirit led that to be is a story we don't know. But at some point, James becomes the leader of the church in Jerusalem. When James and Cephas, uh, that's his Hebrew name, um, Peter, uh, when James and Peter and John, John, the beloved disciple, the disciple Jesus loved and he who loved Jesus, the, the one who, who leaned across Jesus uh, uh, when they were taking Holy Communion uh, and eating the, the, the Last Supper. Uh, here's three of the named leaders influential people in Jerusalem. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave me the right hand of fellowship. They, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Only, here's the only thing they asked, they asked us to remember the poor. 
the very thing I was eager to do. And in fact, they'd, they'd probably just brought an offering to the poor and they were just saying, keep that up. And later in his ministry, Paul is going to bring back an offering from the churches to Jerusalem for the poor in Jerusalem. He never stopped caring for the poor of the brothers and sisters and receiving an offering to care for them. Uh, this coming month, you're going to see it in the newsletter just coming out. We'll be taking a special offering for uh, the Christian ministry that the North American Lutheran Church supports that is active in Ukraine and in surrounding countries where the, uh, uh, the, the, the refugees are fleeing to. So you'll have an opportunity to make a contribution to Good Hope uh, to be passed on to uh, the SON, uh, Spiritual Orphans Network, uh, in Ukraine and the surrounding countries in, in Eastern Europe. They, they're a ministry that specializes in working in former communist bloc uh, countries. And we've had personal visits from our previous bishop and, and leaders there. And uh, with COVID the last couple of years, we haven't gone, but, but we've remained strong ties. And uh, many NALC congregations have been sending over thousands of dollars in, in support of the work there. So we want to be a part of that uh, uh, relief effort. And I have a few things written, uh, just a couple examples of what we're doing and what has been done already in the newsletter. Um, so he's been asked to remember the poor. That's all you have to do. The gospel he is being preached has been certified as the true gospel by Peter, James, and John. Now, James, the brother of Jesus, Peter, and John. Now, that's his first um, word to the Galatians about this gospel message. It has been checked out and approved by the leadership in Jerusalem. Now, this was done privately. This wasn't yet the large gathering, and that's why I think that it's right between chapter 14 and chapter 15. It has to be there um, uh, because th this letter he sent went out before. And, and later in his second missionary journey, he takes the letter that was out in, in uh, Acts chapter 15, and he takes it to show the people that indeed this is the proved word. I wrote you about it. Now, now we have a letter to show you. Well, that was his first instance. This was approved by the leadership of the church, by Peter himself, by James, the brother of Jesus, and by the gospel writer, John. Point number two, pretty dramatic. Now, when Cephas came to Antioch, um, the um, James and, excuse me, uh, Barnabas and Paul and Titus returned to Antioch and continued their work. And at some point there, Cephas, Peter, came to Antioch. And when he was there, Paul says, I opposed him to his face. Paul will fight anybody for the gospel. And leaders of the church have their weaknesses, Paul as well. Uh, certainly this is an experience where Paul is showing, showing that Peter himself had a weakness and he challenged him. I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain members came from James, so Peter had come up, and then later after Peter was there, some more Jews came down from Jerusalem, and they were of the Judaizer faction. Um, before men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles, like he did with Cornelius. But when they came... He drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. There's that group again. Some of the ones who sneaked into the uh, confidential conversations he was having with the, those who seemed influential in Jerusalem. Uh, well, they're here again. They just are relentless. And they uh, are, have been going throughout Galatia correcting what Paul said. Well, Paul will have none of that. Because it's not just who he, who J Peter is eating with. It's what it means. Because he stood condemned, certain men came back, and when they did, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hip hypocritically along with him. Peter at that moment has already said, Jews do not, Gentiles do not need to become like Jews, and you can eat with them. But he stopped. 
Why didn't Peter stand strong? I don't know. We all fall down. I do. And, and well, God forgives us and we have grace to move on. But at that point, Peter fell down. He acted hypocritically along, and, and he led others astray. And here, who did he lead astray? The rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him so that even Barnabas, this would be for the second missionary journey. And remember at the second missionary journey, there was a split between Barnabas and Saul and they went their separate ways. Paul to Galatia and, and Barnabas to Cyprus who took John Mark. Even Barnabas was led astray by, the, by their hypocr hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile, while you were here, you were eating with the Gentiles, you weren't a being observant then, if you, a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? This was a hot topic in the Christian church, in the early Christian church whether someone had to be, live like a Jew to be a real Christian. The answer the church has come up with is absolutely not. Faith alone. But it had to be figured out. And it took a little while. And it was a bit of a struggle. And Paul remained true to the gospel message. And thank God that he did. Now, that gospel message, and we just have a couple of minutes left, is going to be introduced here at the end of chapter 2, and then he's going to explore it more deeply in chapter 3 and 4. But basically, he's going to say, if we just summarize it, even in the words of the little video uh, right here uh, in this little at bottom portion, the heart of Paul's gospel, when people trust in Jesus, what's true of him becomes true of them. I have been crucified with, with the Messiah, and it's not I who come back to life, but the Messiah living in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave his life for me. Chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. Well, let's go there. Verse 15. We ourselves, Paul, are Jews by birth, and not Gentile sinners. And that's how Gentiles were viewed by Jews, heathens, uh, Gentiles. Uh, yet we know... We Jews know that a person is not justified by works of the law. Um, no human being is justified by works of the law, but through faith in, Christ, in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus um, in order to be justified by faith in Christ. Um, we are not justified by works of the law. Every Jew is a sinner. That's why they need sacrifices. It's never made them perfect. We are justified only by faith in Christ and not by works of the law because by works of the law, no one will be justified. That's part of the purpose of the law is to hold up a mirror to show us our true selves and to say, I have failed. When we, when we have that thought that I've failed again, good, the law has done its job. That is its purpose. His purpose is to condemn and to kill. It, it, yes, it, it's there slightly to show us how we ought to live, but because it has no power to do it, its primary purpose is to show us that God has a standard, the law, and we fail to keep it. So we are condemned. By works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. I think he's referring to Peter here. If you realize that you were justified in Christ and then you start trying to, to earn God's favor by things you're doing, and Christians do this all the time. God will love me more if I do whatever. Hogwash. It is not possible for him to love you more than when you were dead in your trespasses, he sent his son to die for you on the cross. God loves sinners. Our gospel lesson this week is the scribes and Pharisees, kind of the Judaizer circumcision party, complaining and grumbling because Jesus is eating with tax collectors and sinners. And so he tells the three lost parables, lost sheep, lost coin, lost son. 
Well, this is the story of Jesus. And if I go back to saying, no, Jesus isn't good enough. Uh, he's not sufficient to save me. I need, God needs my help. Well, first of all, that's just foolishness, isn't it? If I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself a transgressor. That's what Peter did. And Paul called him out publicly because Peter's sin was public. Um, and, and, and it was affecting the whole community. For through the law, I died to the law. So that the law just killed me. So I guess if I'm dead, I can't follow it anymore. Through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. And then this wonderful verse. Uh, that everything that happened in, in the cross, I, and, and in faith, I am brought into Christ and Christ is brought into me. And, and so what happens to me? I am nailed to the cross, my old sinful self, and Christ dies, so I die with him. And then when he rises to newness of life, because I'm in Christ, I rise with him. Someone said, if this was a, here's a, I have a little book here. And so if I, I were to, oh, I can't open this. It's cellophane up. But if I could, I could put a dollar bill in that book and I could roll it up and throw it in the fire. What happens to the dollar bill? It gets burned up. Why? Because the book is burned up. And whatever's in the book, whatever happens to the book happens to the dollar bill. Well, that's the thought. I am placed by God in Christ. Whatever happens to Christ, his crucifixion, death, and resurrection happens to me because I'm in Christ. Here's what he says. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, trusting only in him for salvation. That's the challenge of the Christian life, to walk the life of faith, not the law, not obedience, but the life of trusting, which will result, of course, in following him denying myself, taking up my cross, um, serving the poor, serving all people, loving one another, forgiving people. My life will be dramatically transformed, but not by works, but by trusting in Jesus and, and gave him. Do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. That's it. If we need Jesus plus something else, then we didn't need Jesus. And his death was super, uh, superfluous. But the center of the Christian faith is Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's our message for today. I enjoy, I, I invite you to come and be with me tomorrow evening when we look at, at chapter three. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for our evening together. Thank you for the gospel message and how Paul has been willing to fight for it. Thank you for how clearly it is articulated here at the end of chapter two that because of God's grace and our faith in his grace, we are incorporated into Christ. And because of his death, we have died. And with his resurrection, we have been raised to new life. And now this life that we live, we live in Christ, in faith in the Son of God. Bless each of us, Lord, as we journey this day, just in the challenge of simply walking with Jesus. Amen. Thank you for joining me. Uh, good to be with you tonight, and um, God bless you. Remember, God loves you, and so do I. Bye-bye.